Hey, it's Brett, and you're watching Brett and Some Books. Today we're continuing The Plot to Seize the White House by Jules Archer. This is part one, chapter three. A month later, Doyle and McGuire returned. Without waiting to inquire whether Butler had changed his mind, McGuire quickly informed him that there had been a change of plans. The general had been right to object to coming to the convention as just another delegate, McGuire acknowledged. It would have been ineffective and a waste of the general's immense prestige. McGuire outlined a new plan in which Butler would gather two or three hundred legionnaires and take them to Chicago on a special train. They would be scattered throughout the audience at the convention and when Butler made an appearance at the spectators' gallery, they would leap to their feet, applauding and cheering wildly. The proceedings would be stampeded with cries for a speech that would not die down until Butler was asked to the platform. Incredulous at the audacity with which this scheme was being unfolded to him, Butler asked what kind of speech his visitors expected him to make. McGuire produced some folded typewritten paper or pages from an inside jacket pocket. They would leave a speech with him to read. McGuire urged Butler to round up several hundred legionnaires, meanwhile, to take to Chicago with him. Holding on to his fraying temper, Butler pointed out that none of the legionnaires he knew could afford the trip or stay in Chicago. McGuire quickly assured him that all their expenses would be paid. But Butler, who was constantly being approached with all kinds of wild schemes and proposals, was not prepared to take the plotters seriously until they could prove they had financial backing. When he challenged McGuire on this point, the veteran slipped a bank book out of his pocket. Without letting the name of the bank or the account be seen, he flipped over the pages and showed Butler two recent deposits, one for $42,000 and the second for $64,000 for, quote, expenses. That settled it. No wounded soldiers Butler knew possessed $10,000 bank accounts. His instinct sharpened by two years' experience on loan from the Marines as a crime-busting director of public safety for Philadelphia warned him that there was something decidedly unsavory about the proposition. He decided to blend skepticism, wariness, and interest in his responses to suggest that he might be induced to participate in the scheme if he could be assured that it was foolproof. He would profess himself interested, but unconvinced as long as he suspected that there was more to be learned about the scheme. So far, they had told him practically nothing except what was barely necessary for the role they wanted him to play. He determined to get to the bottom of the plot while trying not to scare them off in the process. After they had left, he read over the speech McGuire had left with him. It urged the American Legion Convention to adopt a resolution calling for the United States to return to the gold standard so that when veterans were paid the bonus promised to them, the money they received would not be worthless paper. Butler was baffled. What did a return to the gold standard have to do with the Legion? Why were McGuire and Doyle being paid to force this speech on the convention? And who was paying them? 